since I preached here, so fasten your seatbelts. I'll try and get you out by three o'clock if you're good. But uh, kind of like the bishop who was inviting you at a church and he said, well, how long can I preach? He said, you can preach as long as you want, but we leave after an hour. So we always start getting up and leaving. I get the picture. So anyway, it's good to have you here. And would you join me in the opening prayer? Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace by our confession of faith to acknowledge and worship the eternal trinity in the majesty of the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith and worship and bring us at last to see you our eternal glory. One God, now and forever. Amen. Stand and sing our opening hymn.
Great job. And uh, just a few announcements are listed in your bulletin. The heads up on the, the grocery bag, you can pick one up at the back, back uh, table back here to fill it with uh, non perishable goods and bring it back next Sunday. There's a lot of people who need, need food. Uh, Thursday, uh, there's a hymn fest here at the church. Tom Trenny from uh, First Primitive Church in, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, is going to lead the event. Our choir members will be there, but also members from all over the community will be singing. So I think there's over 30 people that are singing from what I heard. And so that'd be a wonderful time. The Jackson Concert Series sponsors that. Uh, July 3rd, you know, we uh, uh, always have our combined service with the Presbyterians. And this year we are at the Presbyterian Church. Just one service at 1030 over there. No services here. And the good news is that uh, they still, I always used to love it because they have ice cream Sundays after the service. It was, a, it, was a, it was a big win for me. I always liked that service. Well, and also Vacation Bible School is coming up July 11th through the 14th, and they need some help. You can see what's needed there in the bulletin. And of course, Music Camp. We have a long tradition here in the church to have Music Camp. We, we are the Music Church, and we have music for kids of all ages. And, Many of these kids, some of them like Josh, who started out with a little kid, and he's still, he's still singing for us. So we're grateful for, for that, and uh, I'm sure they can use some help there as well. So those are the announcements. And so it's, it, that it's time for our morning offering this time. <laughs>
comes from your hand and you've entrusted to us the resources that you've blessed us with. So use these gifts, these talents, these, these, these gifts, honor and glorify your name. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. said, memorize this song, you will need it. And he's right. It's a confession of, of, of guilt, asking for creation, that God created a clean heart in our lives. David wrote this song, King David, after his, his problem that he had with Bathsheba and, and uh, his confession back to God. Now this morning, when I need some help on this, uh, I, one of the joys I've had this past year is I sang in the choir. And they said, we'll let you in the choir but we're going to have you sit right next to Dave Wedding and just do what Dave, follow Dave, he'll tell you what page you're supposed to be on and the pitch and all that kind of stuff. And so it worked out well. So Dave, I'm going to ask for your help here in this song. You and I and Bob Willis over here. Yeah. Well, so we'll do the, the light print. So you got Bob and Dave and I will do the light print. The rest of the congregation will do the dark print. So here we go. Again, 
against you, you only, have I sinned, and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Scriptures listed on top of that. It's a very familiar scripture, Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved, through him, through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, May the words of my mouth and our meditations together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our Lord, our rock, and our redeemer, and we pray in your name. Amen. Well, when someone says they're going to preach the gospel, you know, the word gospel literally means good news. And my outline is very simple. I didn't talk to you that. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them what you just told them, and then remind them what you just told them. So those of you who are outlined preach, get your pen out. I've got them. A is good news, B is bad news, C is great news, and D is the choice. So there you go. Um, there were two baseball players sitting in the dugout one afternoon, and they were wondering if there's baseball in heaven. And they, they made a pact. They said, well, if one of us dies, somehow the other one would come back and let them know if there's baseball in heaven. And so sure enough, one of them died. Not too long after that, the other guy was sitting in the dugout, and his friend appeared to him and said, Well, 
tell me, is there baseball in heaven? He said, well, I've got good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is, yes, there is baseball in heaven. Some of the greats play every day. We have a game every afternoon. He said, well, what's the bad news? Well, the bad news is I looked at the schedule and you're pitching next Thursday. <laughs> the good news, start the Bible, the message of the gospel, the message of the church that we proclaim starts with good news, the good news of creation. The fact is you've been made by God. You've been knit together in your mother's womb. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You're not here by accident. You matter to God. Have you heard that before? If you understand that, if it moves from your head to your heart, I'm convinced it'll change your life. Because your view of God will determine a lot about your view of yourself, your view of others, your, your view of, of life in general. And if you really believe that God matters, that you matter to God, and that God loves you unconditionally, it'll change your life. It really will. Because you don't have to prove anything. You know, it doesn't matter what everybody thinks or whatever, and God of the universe loves you, that covers the basis. And God's love is not kind of a fickle kind of love. It's not like the fourth grade class whose teacher was home recovering from surgery and they got together, the class got together and sent the teacher a card and they said, the fourth grade class wishes you a speedy recovery by the vote of 15 to 14. <laughs> That's not how God loves. God, God does not have a fickle love. He loves you unconditionally. You matter to God. In fact, say that to the person next to you. Turn to the person and say, you matter to God. Now turn to the other person and say, you, you got to do it. You matter to God. There we go. So, that's the first, that's the good news. And, you know, God doesn't make it junk. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. You've been made for, to be in a relationship with you. Look at this. Jeremiah 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Some time ago, I was on an airplane, and a guy sitting next to me said, What do you do for a living? I said, Well, I'm a minister. That pretty much ended the conversation. <laughs> but this, this guy said, Well, let me tell you, I don't believe in God. And I said, Well, tell me about the God that you don't believe in. Give a whole litany of the things. And said, You know, I agree with you 100%. I don't believe in God like that either. I believe God is, is loving. God is also just, but He's loving. He's for you, not against you. He's on your side, He's by your side. He's a God who, 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 who sees you not so much as what you are, but what you can become. And that's that's wonderful. We have that kind of a God. That's the good news. But I got some bad news. The Bible is very clear that we have a sin problem. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned the wrong way. And the iniquity of God has fallen upon us. All of us have sinned. Well, sin, Greek words, hamartia, it's missing the mark. No one is perfect. I preached one time, I said, is there anybody in this congregation who's perfect? The one lady in the back row said, yeah, my wife's first husband. <laughs> the rest of us fall short. And we all have a problem with sin. Sin is, is basically saying to God, God, I have a better idea, I want to do it my way. This is Trinity Sunday, we worship that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everybody worships the Trinity. Unfortunately for many people, their Trinity is me, myself, and I. And they worship themselves. And they uh, don't have time for God, don't believe in God, whatever the case. So the, plan, the, the bad news is all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God's been great on the curve. Whenever we hear something like that, we say, well, you know, I've got some problems, I admit, but I'm certainly not as bad as Job over here, or Marcy over here. Well, God did great on the curve. His standard is perfection. So there, God has a dilemma. I create this creation. I love them. I design them to be in a relationship with me for eternity. But because of their sinfulness, I'm separated from them. So God did something that we could not do for ourselves. He devised a, a, a rescuing plan, so to speak, if I put it that way. He sent Jesus to come to this earth. He lived here 33 years. He taught us what God was like. He made some outlandish claims about himself that got him in trouble with the religious people. He said, I, am the, I and the Father are one. He said, I have come to, uh, the thief comes to steal and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life, have it everlasting. He said, he, he said uh, I'm, uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. 
He who follows me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And all the religious people said, who? Who is this guy? He's a heretic. And there's good reason why they took him to the cross, because he brought the religious folks to one. He always had time for the sinners. But the self-righteous folks who thought they had it all together uh, and were following the law, but weren't really following the law, he, he would always say, you've heard it say, you've heard it said this, I tell you this. And so he, he was a rebel. And he went to the cross, but he, the, 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 he, his whole life was designed to go to the cross, because when he did that, the last thing he said on the cross was, it is finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. He, he accomplished what he came to do. Three things, he defeated sin, he defeated death, and he defeated the, the, the devil. And he rose again. And the uniqueness of the Christian faith, yet for, beside all the other religions that people profess, the Christian faith is the only faith that their leader claims to have resurrected from the dead. We don't worship at a tomb commemorating, commemorating our leader. The tomb's empty. We celebrate that. We are Easter people. We believe in the resurrection. And one day we will all be raised and will stand before him for God to make an account of our life. So the great news is that we can have a pardon for our sins. When Jesus died on the cross, he offers us a full and complete pardon. Uh, he offers us a purpose for the future. And because of that, we can have peace in the present. That doesn't mean we're not going to have problems, things we have to deal with in life. But when you know that you know that you know you are connected to God and your future is secure, it changes how you view life day, day by day. I use this illustration I used in the first service. This whole plan of God taking your place, suppose this young man murdered somebody and got the death penalty. And he deserved it, he did it. And it finally came to the time when he would have his last meal before he was executed. What would you have? First service is a chicken. I think you can do better than that. I said fried chicken, but now I'm thinking smoked wings, maybe some fried bread over a coleslaw. Coleslaw over? If I were you to throw a little ice cream, it's not going to hurt you. At this point, it doesn't make much difference. So this is it. It's it. And what would happen if someone came to this prison and said, wait a minute, I will take your place and I will allow you to walk out of this prison cell with a full and complete pardon as if you've never committed the crime. Well, what would you say? I said, whoa, oh, that's amazing. Can you guys go to No, you can't do it now. <laughs> <laughs> that's the gospel. All of us have sinned. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He was our substitute. He took our place so that, you know, the sin all the sins of the world were placed on him so that we could be set free. We can receive a pardon. What's, and that's the heart of the Christian faith. We've been forgiven, not because we earn it, not because we deserve it. It's a gift by, of God by his grace. But we receive it by faith. We have a part to play in that process. And so D. Stanley Jones was a great Methodist uh, evangelist in India. And they asked E. Stanley Jones, what, give us one word, a synonym for the Christian faith. He thought for a moment, and he, he replied with the word transformation. He said that the essence of the gospel is that by God's grace, we can be changed in the depths of our being. God is in life-changing business. You don't have to be tomorrow like you are today. He can take away the addictions. He can help you and, and set you free. Uh, I had my... Uh, a couple weeks ago, I had my 50th anniversary of a graduation from high school. You can do the math. I'm 69. But there was, it was actually 51 years. And uh, we got together, a bunch of us, and we had a great football team then, and we bragged about our We get better every year, every time we meet. Boy, we, we're better and better until we put the, the film on and say, gosh, I don't know, we weren't all that good. But almost to a T, all my friends, I'd get around and say, they would say, Urson, how did you ever become a minister? I was not exactly a minister of material when I was in high school, let's put it that way. And I said, well, let me tell you the story. 
after my freshman year in college, I came home early on a Saturday night around nine o'clock, which I normally didn't do. And I, was, I said, God, there's gotta be more to life than, what, than this. I turned the TV on and they have a program in Dallas, Texas called Explo 72. It's actually 50 years ago, right around now. There was over 8,000 young people at Dallas Stadium, Cotton Bowl, and it was put on by Campus Crusade for Christ. And uh, I turned the TV on, up came a guy named Mike McCoy. Does that ring a bell? Mike McCoy uh, was a first round draft choice of the Green Bay Packers, and he told his testimony. He said, on the outside, I looked great. I had traffic to the success, I had money and fame and position. Maybe it was great, but something was missing on the inside. My ears perked up. Yeah, I can identify with that. And he said, then I invited Christ into my life and everything's been changed. I'm a different person. God is in the business of transforming my life. And I remember getting on my knees and saying, God, if there's anything to this, I'm open. Now I'd like to tell you lightning struck and I didn't hear anything. But about three months later, I had to go to the football practice. I called the coach and said, I'm transferring to a school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He said, well, and that, that changed my life. I got involved in the discipleship program. I invited Christ into my life. I found out that Christianity is not just a religion that you follow, but it's a relationship with Jesus. The difference is like night and day. You see, I grew up in the church. I sang in the church water as a high school kid. I went to church every Sunday. I went to the camps and did all the stuff. And I knew all the lingo, all the, everything you're supposed to know, but it never moved from my head down to my heart. But that process, God got a hold of me and pulled me out of where I was going and, uh, and it changed my life. I met Susan in an abnormal psychology class. Told her to throw the book away and start dating me. We'd cover most of the material in the book. She fell for that line. We've been married 46 years. So my son is not very there. I said, you need to find an abnormal psychology class and look around the room. It'll work for me, it could work for you. So far, not no luck. But the point being is, the Christian faith is more than just following a religion. It's experiencing the grace of God that he offers and applying it to your life. And he, he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things pass away, behold, all things become new. In my life, the things that were very important in the past didn't, didn't do anything for me anymore. They were important. Things that were not important at all became very important. I had a whole new view on life. And uh, when, I, when I found Christ, and he became not just my Savior, but my Lord. I tried to follow him. It's one thing that it's one thing to profess faith, but it's another thing to live it out. So, uh, the good news is, God knows you, God loves you, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. The bad news is, we all have a sin problem. And because of the sin problem, all you don't have to do is read the paper. The root cause of all the stuff that's happening in our world, in our homes, in our families, in our communities, in our, in our nation, in our world. The, the root cause is that we are separated from God. We have a heart problem, and it's not going to depend on who's in the White House or whatever. We have a heart problem, and only God, we need a revival in the United States of America. I think it may be our only hope. We need a revival. We need to turn our hearts back to God. And where does it start? It starts in my heart. It starts in your heart. It starts you know, where, where we live. And so the great news is, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest in which you boast. And the claims of Christ are, are very clear. He said, I, I have come that you might have a life and have it abundantly. Uh, that leads us to the choice. Good news, bad news, great news. The choice can force you into any kind of relationship. You have to say yes, you have to say no. And I have the scripture, choose for yourselves today who you will serve. The children of Israel, before they were entered the promised land, Joshua confronted them and said, okay, folks, who are you going to serve? There's plenty of gods across the river, plenty of nations, plenty of gods you can serve. He said, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the, serve the Lord. And when the Israelites did that, they prospered. When they started serving the other gods, look what happened. They had problems. Nothing has changed. 
Peter, the fact of the matter is you are serving something. You are serving somebody. Each one of you has a God. <laughs> Whatever's first place in your life is your God. And God wants, and the first commandment is put God first. God's not interested in being number five on your hate parade in cases of emergency only. He wants to be not just your savior, but he wants to be your Lord. He wants you to give your life to him, and he will guide and direct you and empower you to keep you on the straight path. Now, it requires some discipline. I go to the gym every day, except Sunday. What if I said, you know, I think I'm going to go to the gym on Christmas and Easter. I'm sure I'll be in great shape. I don't think so. There's a discipline. You have to do it on a regular basis to, to get your body in shape. The same thing is true spiritually. John Wesley talked about the spiritual discipline that helped you stay alive spiritually, that helped you stay connected. And you know all of them. Worship, prayer, the sacraments, uh, fellowship with other Christians. You need, you need to be intentional about staying connected. That's why the church is so important. God has instituted the church with all of its imperfections to be the means of grace to help people on their journey of faith. Someone one, one told me, he said, you know, he wasn't talking about this church, but he said, you know, I don't want to go to church, there's just a bunch of hypocrites there. And I said, well, we have room for one more. Come and join us. And one, and one, we were all kind of hypocritical. None of us live up to what we could, could be or should be. But we're on the journey. The big thing is you're on your journey. The choice is yours. Probably the best person summarizes what I've been saying the moment this today is Revelation 3.20. It was written to the church, but it could be applied to our lives personally. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. God is knocking at the door of your life. He's been seeking you from the moment of your conception. He has a plan and purpose for your life. God seeks you, hopefully, for God, through parents, through the church, through different avenues. He's knocking. But if anyone hears my voice, sometimes we're so preoccupied, we don't hear the voice of God. We're busy. We're running around, chasing around, doing all sorts of things, and we, we ignore God. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, the knock to that door is not on the outside. God's not going to force his way into your life. You have, you open the door. By the grace of God, you open the door, but that's called faith. Opening the door to God is, is faith. You're saved by grace, what? Through faith. You open the door and you invite him to come into your life, into your home, so to speak. Now, have you done that? You know, I've I was in the church for 19 years. I don't ever remember anyone inviting me to do to, make a, to, to open the door, so to speak, to God. I just thought, you know, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Well, the devil believes in God. <laughs> believe me. Uh, it's more than that. It's, you know, it, affect, it needs to affect lifestyle. And so, for 19 years, I was a good, good uh, church goer. I was a good kid. Because you know, I sang in the choir. Dave, you could have been next to me. You helped me out. And but after when I turned 19, everything changed. The thought of becoming a minister when I was in high school, I mean, I was afraid to raise my hand and ask a question in class. The thought of having to preach a sermon every, every seven, Sunday shows up every seven days. You're supposed to have something to say. Uh, Jim, Jim, uh, what's his name, first one? Jim Nolan, in the first service, I'd always come up to him in the first service and say, Jim, you got an idea for a sermon today? Try to come up with something. And Jim said, yeah, I've got an idea. Why don't you preach a sermon on being prepared? <laughs> I said, that doesn't help me now. <laughs> so, anyway, the choice is yours. And now some of you, I know you've opened the door. You know God's in your life. But some of you have kept him on the front porch, you know. Yeah, God, I want, I, I, want to get, I want to be a Christian, but I don't want you hanging around my living room and going to the kids' bed, you know, and certainly going upstairs in my, the closets that I have up there. I don't want anybody up there. God's not interested in being in your front door. He wants the keys to the house. And he wants to, be, he wants to transform and change every room. And you become more Christ-like. And the fruit of the Spirit starts to become a part of your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The Holy Spirit lives within you. And he's in the business of changing you as you cooperate with, with the Spirit. 
So the choice is, is your choice. My prayer, there may be somebody here who you know you really haven't opened the door. You, you, you can do it today. And some of you, maybe, maybe you need to give the keys to Jesus and say, God, I don't want to be just a good person. I want to follow you. I want you to be my Savior, but also my Lord. Wherever you are this morning, I invite you to take a step of faith. Open the door. Invite Christ to be to change you and your, your family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these people. I love these people for nine years. They're good people. And they are blessed in so many ways. But Lord, it's easy for us to be in church uh, and not really get it. I did it for 19 years. We can be good, but not, we, we, we haven't pulled open the door. So if there's anybody here that hadn't done that, maybe simply say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. And I turn away from that. I turn to you and I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. Part, give me a pardon for my sin. Give me a purpose for the future. Empower me to live out my faith. Give me the grace to grow and to become more and more Christ-like. I don't know, but they all of us are on a journey. Wherever you are today, my prayer is that you'll grow closer to Jesus, that you'd come to know him in a way like you've never known before, that you would trust in him and know that you matter to God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's say, let's stand. Let's say the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And the Apostles' Creed. If you come to church and you affirm the Apostles' Creed, which really is a synopsis of what the church, the Christian church, believes, you're making a confession of faith every Sunday, whether you know it or not. So let's, let's affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. It's on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Now, my prayer is that the closing hymn would not be just some words you sang. May it be your prayer to God that we sing together our closing hymn.
benediction. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us go into the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Experience and grace, exploring truth, and Christ in love.